Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to the National Press Club. I am Mark Rosell. I serve as Dean of the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And we host the Michael Hayden Center for Intelligence Policy and International Security. So welcome to Spy Watchers. This promises to be a wonderful program. Uh, if you don't know, the Shar School of Policy and Government is one of 10 schools or colleges at George Mason University. Uh, we're about 2,000 students strong in 11 different degree programs in Arlington, Virginia, and in Fairfax, Virginia. And among our very highly ranked academic programs actually is our master's degree program in international security studies uh, that US News and World Report last year ranked as number three in the country. We have a very diverse faculty of scholars and practitioners, which makes us quite unique. And among those faculty for the past 10 years has been Michael Hayden himself. Uh, he's been an absolute gem in the classroom as he has uh, been a public servant throughout all of his life. Uh, we're very honored to have him on the George Mason University faculty and to be hosting the Michael Hayden Center there. Uh, we all wish Michael, of course, a speedy recovery so he can get back to the public square. He is such an important and powerful voice uh, in the sphere of uh, public debate and discourse during some very difficult times. So I would like to introduce the executive director of the Michael Hayden Center, who I believe has a message from Michael as well, Larry Pfeiffer. Larry? Thank you uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, really appreciate the turnout. I know December, it's cold outside and uh, people have a lot of competing priorities between holiday parties, shopping and uh, whatnot. So thank you very much for coming out uh, tonight. Uh, General Hayden is uh, obviously very sorry that he cannot be here tonight. Um, I know many of you know, for those who don't know, uh, General Hayden did suffer a fairly serious stroke uh, in late November. Uh, he is very, very hard, uh, working hard at recovery as we speak uh, at a Rehabilitation Hospital where he'll be spending, uh, uh, unfortunately, part of the holidays uh, there working, working hard to get back to us all here. Um, he, the, he has asked me to uh, extend um, his and his family's uh, thanks to all of you and to anybody watching uh, on television. Uh, his thanks for all the uh, prayers, the concerns, the well wishes, the notes, the cards, uh, folks from all walks of life, complete strangers from across the United States and around the globe. It's been very, very heartwarming uh, and uh, inspiring. And I know, uh, I know he uh, uh, he's watching us on TV right now, and uh, uh, I know he uh, appreciates all that. So, given the fact that he is watching us on television right now, I thought it would be a great opportunity for all of us to extend our well wishes through a round of applause for General Hayden. Thank you, I know that will mean a lot to him and his family. Thank you very much. Uh, the Hayden Center, for those who don't know, uh, very briefly, we are at the Shar School of Policy and Government. And we are here to, uh, uh, our noble cause is to uh, educate uh, the broad public about intelligence and how it uh, informs uh, and sometimes doesn't inform policy uh, as, uh, as our nation's leaders make those hard decisions about uh, events around the world. And so we, uh, we have a series of events that we do throughout the year. This year, uh, our theme uh, has focused on uh, uh, the accountability of intelligence. I'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, but first, just a quick uh, uh, handful of administrative notes. Uh, first, uh, um, I would ask you, uh, when we have our question and answer session uh, a little bit later, uh, a couple of asks for you. Number one, uh, wait to be called on. That would be great. Uh, number two, wait for a microphone to be handed to you so the rest of us can hear you as well as the folks on television can hear you. Uh, I would also appreciate it if you could identify yourself when you ask the question. Uh, if you have an affiliation that you would like to let us know about, please mention your affiliation. Uh, and last and most importantly, we would love it to be a question and not a speech. So uh, appreciate that as much as possible. Uh, in addition, we have a reception at the end of the event. This reception is for everybody in this room. 
So please do come to the reception, enjoy a drink, enjoy some food, uh, enjoy an opportunity to converse one-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, our panel members. We really would appreciate that. Um, as I mentioned, this is, uh, this is one in a series of events we're doing this year on the accountability of intelligence. We did an event on the 11th of September. Uh, it focused on the relationship of a, president, of a president of the United States with his intelligence community leaders. Um, and uh, uh, if you are interested in that event, if you weren't able to attend it, it is available on YouTube on our Michael V. Hayden Center channel as well as on our website. So uh, uh, please avail yourself of that opportunity. It was a really entertaining evening. Uh, we uh, will be doing uh, two more events in this series later in the year. In February, we hope to be able to do an event that will focus on congressional oversight and the, the importance of uh, the role of Congress in overseeing our intelligence activities. Uh, and then in April, we will do an event that will talk about the role of the press and the media in helping to uh, govern and oversee uh, our intelligence activities. Uh, tonight, however, we're gonna focus uh, on uh, spy watchers. Uh, these are the people who are inside the intelligence community or inside the executive branch, whose job it is to make sure uh, that those intelligence activities are conducted uh, in a legal, moral, and ethical manner. Um, what I'd ask, uh, I'd, I'd love, uh, I'm one of those obnoxious uh, hosts here. I'm gonna ask you all to do something. Uh, I would love everyone to stand up for a moment. Please stand up, stand up. Thank you. I would like you all to raise your right hand Fantastic. Now I want you to just look around the room at your colleagues and friends and such here. Fantastic, now you can all sit down. So when you looked across the room here, you saw people standing with their right hand up. Uh, what I'd like you to know is that is what every single member of the United States intelligence community does on their very first day of work. They stand up, they raise their right hand, and they swear an oath, or they affirm an oath if they can't swear. And that oath is to uh, protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. It's to bear true faith and allegiance to that Constitution and to the laws derived from that Constitution. And it's to uh, well and faithfully discharge uh, the duties of their office. Um, it's, it's a powerful moment for anyone who's ever experienced it. And it sets the tone for everybody's career as they move forward in their intelligence careers. So that's a number one important thing to remember. Uh, number two, uh, the other thing to remember is that they're all human beings, and so they will make mistakes. And there are some who will be seduced by the power that is vested in them. There are some who will, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, skew over into criminal behavior. Uh, what we're gonna talk about tonight are the ways in which the intelligence community uh, protects itself and governs itself against those instances where uh, we are not, in, as expected, entirely true and faithful to uh, the Constitution. So with that, I want to go ahead and introduce our panel members. Uh, I'll introduce them one at a time. I'm going to flip my paper over to make sure that I get everybody's name and everything right here. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Mark Zaid. Mark Zaid is a founding partner of Mark Zaid PC. It's a law firm that focuses on national security law, free speech claims, and government accountability. Uh, he has represented many whistleblowers, uh, again, a very important function uh, in our U.S. intelligence community. These are people who feel that they, uh, ha they, they've availed themselves of the opportunities inside and still don't feel that their uh, grievances have been addressed, and so uh, it's another avenue uh, of approach. So please welcome Mark. Secondly, I would like to invite uh, George Little to the stage. George Little, uh, he and I go back a long ways. He was a director of public affairs at CIA and a spokesperson for CIA uh, prominently during the Leon Panetta years as director. Uh, he then went with uh, uh, Director Panetta over to the Department of Defense where he served as the assistant to the Secretary for Public Affairs and many of you probably remember him appearing on television as the Pentagon Press Secretary. So please welcome George. Uh, our next panel member is uh, the former acting general counsel of CIA, its chief legal officer through probably uh, one of the most uh, turbulent periods in our recent national history. Uh, he served as the chief legal officer for much of the time uh, from 2001 uh, through about uh, 2000, what John? 2009. So you can all tr go through your you know, historical Rolodex in your mind and think about all the cool things that happened between 2001 and 2009. John was the guy that was making the legal recommendations to the director of CIA and leading a staff of lawyers that made recommendations to the uh, officers of the agency uh, as they uh, took on uh, you know, 
uh, edgy, edgy operations uh, in support of the defense of our country. So please, uh, John is now uh, at Steptoe, Steptoe and Johnson. He's also the author of a great book, if you haven't had the chance to read it, it's called Company Man, 30 Years of Controversy and Crisis in the CIA. If you wanna know what a lawyer's life is like at the CIA, it's a great book to read. So please welcome John Rizzo. Uh, next, I'd, I'd like to introduce a, a real national treasure. Uh, Lisa Monaco um, has a long and storied career in the Department of Justice uh, and its components, uh, culminating with her being Assistant Attorney General for National Security. Uh, she also had a little job at one point being the uh, Chief of Staff to a guy named Robert Mueller at the FBI. So during the cocktail hour, you can ask her all the questions you want about Bob Mueller. Um, she, uh, uh, finished her government career serving the President of the United States as the uh, Assistant for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, uh, and now spends a good amount of her time uh, educating the next generation of lawyers up at uh, NYU Law School. Please welcome Lisa Monaco. Uh, last but not least, a uh, good friend of mine um, is Michael Morell. Uh, Michael Morell is serving as our moderator tonight in General Hayden's stead. He was going to be a panel member, so now he gets to ask questions instead of answer them, which is mm -hmm. always great. Uh, but Michael is a former acting director uh, of CIA and deputy director of CIA, um, but he's uh, very famously known for being, I think, the only human being uh, that was with President Bush on 9-11 and was with President Obama uh, on the day of the Osama bin Laden takedown. So a lot of great stories he can tell you during the cocktail hour. Well, please welcome Michael Morell, and we'll get started. <laughs> Thank you, Larry, and good evening to everybody, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I just want to start by reiterating what Mark and Larry said about General Hayden. Um, I know that I speak for all of the panel members here um, in wishing him a speedy and full recovery and wishing the best to him and his wonderful family. Um, we're going to miss him here tonight just as we miss his, uh, his reasonable voice um, at this difficult time in our nation's history. So uh, uh, General Hayden, we're thinking about you. So American intelligence agencies um, are secret organizations <coughs> operating in a democracy. And the secret part of that makes it difficult to convince the public, which is the democracy part of it, that the intelligence community is number one operating uh, within the bounds of the Constitution and statute and regulations. Um, number two, that it's actually doing the job that it's supposed to do, um, and it's actually protecting the country. And number three, that it's doing all of that in a way, using the money, that the taxpayer's money in a way that makes sense, that it's doing all of that efficiently. Right? Um, and at the end of the day, the way you square that, the way you square that, that giving that public that sense of those three things is oversight. And there are a lot of different mechanisms to oversight. You know, the two that we think about the most are congressional oversight and oversight by the media. Um, but there are a lot of oversight mechanisms um, in the executive branch for what happens um, inside the intelligence community. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. We'll talk about Congress and the media at future sessions. So to get started, let me just give you a list of many of the mechanisms in the executive branch for overseeing the intelligence community. Number one, there are lawyers, lots of lawyers. There are general counsels at each intelligence community agency. There is a DNI general counsel. There is an NSC lawyers group. So a small group of lawyers from the National Security Agency who get together regularly to ensure that the policy steps of the United States to include those that the agencies are under, the intelligence community agencies are undertaking are legal. Um, there's the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice, which is the nation's lawyer. And ultimately, it's, there's, there's the Attorney General himself or herself. So lots of lawyers. Secondly, there are Inspector Generals at the different intelligence agencies. And there's an inspector general at the DNI. And some of those inspector generals are statutory, have special responsibility to Congress. 
Third, there are executive branch oversight bodies. There is the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. There is the Intelligence Oversight Board. And there's the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. And then there's ad hoc commissions as well, such as the one that I served on for President Obama after the Snowden disclosures on technology and intelligence collection. And fifth, fourth, I'm sorry, there are whistleblower prov um, um, provisions. Um, some of those defined in statute and some of those defined in regulation. We'll talk, we'll talk about those. And I want to add one more to tonight's discussion because I wasn't sure where to put it in this series, and that's the FISA court. It right? doesn't fit in media, doesn't fit in Congress, didn't fit in the president's discussion, so we're going we're to put it in tonight's discussion even though it's not part of an executive branch oversight body. Okay? So, a lot of different, lot of different oversight going on here. Um, so to kick this off, and with all of that as background, let me turn to our panelists. And I want to start by asking John and then Mark mm -hmm. a simple question. Why so much oversight? What brought us mm -hmm. here? What's the history? John? Well, I assume, Michael, you're not calling on me because I'm the oldest person on this panel. <laughs> but <clears throat> I actually... Uh, I actually joined the CIA uh, in 1976 uh, as a young, uh, totally naive, uh, two years out of law school graduate. I was among the first wave of lawyers who were hired by the CIA um, after the Church and Pike Committee investigations. We, we all remember those. <clears throat> I was the 18th lawyer hired, and to your point, Michael, by the time I, re I uh, retired in 2009, we had about 130, and I understand we have dozens more now. So that's the history. Um, not that I personally had anything to do with this, but that marked the beginning of oversight, really. Before that, in the 50s and 60s, there was none. The 1976 marked the beginning of the establishment of oversight committees in the House and Senate. Uh, there was the establishment of the President's Intelligence Oversight Board out of the White House uh, to specifically oversee, from the executive branch perspective, intelligence activity. So that's that's how it all that's so, how it all started. So what was it though that brought us to that need for oversight? Well, I mean, there was just um, you know the thing perversely that drew me to apply to CIA <clears throat> in the first place back in. 75, were the, uh, the church committee hearings, where, you know, this was the first time, a year before Cy Hirsch and New York Times first broke the stories about CIA drug experiments, 50s and 60s, assassination plots, uh, and there were, there were these sensational televised hearings in 1975. <clears throat> Actually, the first televised hearings uh, at that point since Watergate. Uh, and there was just this revulsion on a bipartisan basis in Congress about not only these activities CIA had done over the previous two decades, but the fact that no one outside the CIA and the few select people in the White House, including the President, knew about them. So, so there was a, a consensus, really, uh, that something had to change. There had to be some sort of oversight. So that's how it was okay. born. Mark, do you want to add to that? They exist because they're needed. And I think John accurately sets forth the history that led to it. The, the US government typically, as I always explain to folks, is far more reactive than proactive. It, it doesn't do a very good job of anticipating something to happen, especially in the intelligence community, and usually then reacts to something bad that happens. Because of course, if it's good, nobody's going to do anything about it, and we might not ever hear about it. <coughs> but excuse me, but there have been and continue to unfortunately be uh, bad things that happen to the intelligence community, sometimes by an individual who does things that they shouldn't have, and then there's a reaction, and oftentimes, other times, by perhaps an agency. Uh, as more of a leadership issue in some of the examples that John mentioned that led to additional reform and oversight. 
And we can certainly talk about whether that oversight works, as I'm sure we will, uh, in, in dealing with some of the threats, uh, insider threats and, and ex outsider threats. Uh, and they're both reacted to very differently, but they both interact very much. Because actually one of the th things that I say in, in dealing with whistleblowers all the time, if, if you want to talk about some of the people who have some say are whistleblowers uh, from within the national security environment, I actually could give you concrete examples of their going public, perhaps in a way that they thought was meaningful and beneficial and needed, has made it harder for other whistleblowers who actually want to follow the rules, to abide by the law and go through the system because of the way the agencies have reacted from an oversight standpoint to prevent another such person and he who shall not be named uh, type situation. I'll let one of you guys say the name so I won't be out there uh, in, in doing it. <laughs> but there, there's a lot of reactions by that where I would have hoped the system could have been improved, but instead I, I think actually it's been made worse. Yeah. Great, we'll come back to that. I'm gonna come back to that. Lisa, let me ask you a question about <coughs> policy oversight um, of the intelligence community. And I wanna do it within the context of the, the general, the generally held view that the Obama White House um, held a pr pretty tight grip on both the US military um, and the intelligence community in terms of the operations it conducted. And my question for you is, is, is do, you, do you think that there's a reason that there's a need um, to more tightly oversee those two organizations than the rest of the government? What's your sense on that? Uh, well, first, let me say thank you to George Mason, to the National Press Club for hosting us, to the uh, Shar School, and of course the Hayden Center for having us. Um, and if I, I'm going to get to your question, but if I can just add to your sure. prior question, I mean, I think the reason we have oversight is in part because, and appropriately so, the uh, over time, the legal and uh, regulatory and policy requirements have increased, and I think it is healthy to have uh, an apparatus within the executive branch to make sure that the intelligence community and the different um, agencies that are part of it are adhering to those requirements. I think that's just good government. And we will discuss, I think, whether that's sufficient. Uh, but I think uh, it has been a natural, appropriate, and I think healthy response to the growth in um, legal and regulatory um, kind of mechanisms to uh, make sure that we're adhering to the balance of both the security that the intelligence community and the military and others are, are um, sworn to provide, as well as, of course, the protections in our Constitution. Um, to your uh, question, I, I think, I guess I would take issue with the notion that there is a particular tight grip on either the military or the intelligence community. I think that there is and was in the Obama administration a general view that the National Security Council, created by the National Security Act of 1947, uh, to be that place where coordination happens within uh, the federal government of all integration of domestic, foreign, and intelligence uh, and military matters. Uh, that there was a view, I think I know President Obama uh, held it, that the National Security Council ought to do its job uh, as laid out in the National Security Act, and it ought to do so pursuant to a very clear process that he uh, articulated in the presidential directive that lays out, that was issued, I think, on the first day of the Obama administration, uh, and I think rightly was following a template that uh, President Bush 41's White House adopted, um, so that there ought to be a process and a careful and clear uh, integration of those interests and uh, a uh, kind of integration of the policy needs and uh, a clear set of goals for that foreign policy and execution of intelligence um, uh, operations and, and matters. And so, you know, I think that there, it makes sense to have that happen with the, to use your words, a pretty tight grip within the White House, because ultimately the president is the single, he's one of two uh, folks who are elected at the federal level and who's accountable uh, for all that, um, for all that policy and, and for all of uh, those operations. So I think it's appropriate to centralize that in the White House. That ought to be, however, 
against a backdrop that it ought not to be an operational entity, as we as uh, learned through some cycles of kind of crisis uh, and reform and response um, in you know prior years around Contra to, to name one. So uh, there ought to be that process. There ought to be that structure. It's appropriate in the White House, but it has to be done adhering to to a certain balance. And I think I would you know I think I would add that that the risks being taken by the US military on a daily basis and the US intelligence community on a daily basis, the risks to um, the nation, the risks to the organizations, and the risks to um, the credibility of the nation, I mean, almost requires, almost requires a level of oversight, right, that we're talking about here. Um, George, I'm wondering from your experience, right, in, in part we're doing this to make sure that mistakes don't happen, mm -hmm. and we're doing it right to ensure the public that, that, that all is being done as it should be done. How do you educate the public about all of this stuff, most of which they don't know anything about? It's a tough job, believe me. I uh, spent many <laughs> years uh, attempting to do so. Uh, I'll let you assess uh, my uh, success or lack thereof. First, let me uh, echo uh, what Lisa said. Thank you to George Mason, to the Schar School, to the Hayden Center. I'd like to give a shout out to Director Hayden, who took a chance on me and made me a spokesman uh, at the agency after having never spoken to a reporter in my life. Uh, and uh, he, uh, it was a real gamble. Uh, secondly, uh, he's a son of Pittsburgh, uh, and I just want him to know that uh, for the remainder of this football season, I'm switching my football allegiance from the Washington Redskins to the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> now that's out of deep affection for him. <laughs> but also a little bit of the Redskins' performance. So <laughs> in any event, uh, uh, certainly hope he's uh, watching, and he'll, uh, I, I want one of those uh, towels. Uh, what was the question again, Michael? <laughs> How do you do your job in making yeah. sure the public understands? So one of the, right? so one, one of the great lines that uh, Director Hayden had in one of his speeches uh, was that, uh, and you alluded to this too, Michael, was that there are the twin imperatives of openness and secrecy. In the CIA Office of Public Affairs, there used to be a button that people wore long before I got there, but there were still some stashed in the desk, and it was comment with no line through. Uh, with a red line through it, no comment. But we made a decision uh, at the agency that that was no longer tenable because there is no natural constituency, let's face it, for the CIA. It just does not exist. You have intelligence officers who support the agency, but it's very difficult to have political following and routine support from other branches of government especially. And so you have to, we, we made a decision to actually say more on the record which surprised a lot of people. <laughs> and there's actually a whole lot you can say about the agency's mission, about its people, and about world events. So the press is obviously one key uh, way of trying to educate. The press is ultimately not the enemy of the intelligence community or anybody else. The press helps inform the American people and yes, we're adversarial from time to time uh, in the intelligence community with the press, but uh, the intelligence community beat reporters who cover the agency and the intelligence community writ large are generally very responsible, and if you develop a relationship of trust, understand when there's a bright line that, uh, that veers on sources and methods, and diming out people or operations that, um, um, you know, might uh, in, uh, harm life or our national security. Now that might get harder in the digital age with bloggers and more of an international press that's looking at all of this. But the press is, in fact, a very important component of that education. Uh, it took us a while at the agency to get through all the security clearances to finally approve, you know, anything on Twitter or Facebook or the rest of it. And the CIA does have a digital presence now and does a very nice job of it. Uh, don't look at my Twitter feed, but the CIA does a lot better. And uh, finally, I think that uh, you have to hearken back to, there's some historians uh, of the agency here, and you have to tell the stories of the accomplished men and women over time who have risked their lives for this nation. And some of those tales can't be told right away, but they can be told as time passes on. 
and with the appropriate clearances from John and others uh, in the general counsel's office. And telling the stories of, I'm just gonna call him Joe, but he was still working at the agency. You know, uh, He just was dropped into Manchuria uh, during World War II and uh, became part of the OSS, I think against his will and stayed with the agency until I left in 2011 as a, as a contractor. You know, spent 70 years of his life uh, in the agency doing incredible things. And you can tell those stories of the men and women of their mission. You can tell world events. You can comment on them. You can have a relationship with the press. And I think that is ultimately the bag of tricks that you have to uh, inform the American people. Let me just, let me just add that when, when General Hayden came to CIA, um, we were more closed. We were less transparent. Um, and I remember him making an argument, which was quite persuasive, that, you know, I think we can push the fence line out in what we talk about. I think we can tell the American people more about what we're doing, um, give them more confidence in who we are and what we do. Um, and by pushing the fence line out, we can actually do a better job protecting what we have to protect. And most Americans understand that we need to have at least some secrets. And I think we did that mm -hmm. during General Hayden's tenure, and I think we tried very hard to continue it um, after he left. Um, but I yeah. think that's really important. Um, I, I want to ask all of you kind of the, the, the big question here, <coughs> which is about effectiveness, right? The effectiveness of this oversight. Um, and so I'm just going to go down the line and start with Lisa. If you could talk about how effective you think all these mechanisms are, um, which, are, which are the most effective in your mind? Um, do we need any more? Do we have too many? Um, how do you think about all of that? Um, so the way I think about oversight in general and the, the part that is done by the executive branch is that it generally has two components to it. I think it has a component that checks, and this is... Um, a lot of what I did in the National Security Division, uh, the lawyers that you left off your copious, your list of uh, no, lawyers, no, no. Um, the National Security Division lawyers has um, a wonderful uh, group of about 100 plus lawyers whose job it is to represent the intelligence community before the FISA court. And um, you know, part of that role, as well as the other lawyers that you mentioned, is to ensure that the legal um, requirements are being met. So think of that in the box of what, um, what can be done. Is what is being done by the intelligence community consistent with law and regulation? But then I also think about compliance in terms of governance, right? This is, is it, does it make sense? Is it consistent with our principles? Is it consistent <clears throat> with who we are? Um, does it follow the, the policy uh, per, um, preferences of um, those who were duly elected and who are accountable uh, to the people? And that I think of in the category of should we do it, right? And I think the most uh, effective oversight mechanisms, mechanisms that I've seen in operation both involve all three branches of government and therefore have the legitimacy that is attached to that uh, and that... Um, touch on both, that are both uh, compliance but also have an element of governance, that ask the question, and this is what I've seen in my work over uh, many, many years with the intelligence community across the board, the CIA, the National Security Agency, uh, the different components, the FBI, of course, the different components of the Defense Department, that uh, there is um, a real effort to get it right, to both uh, satisfy the legal compliance to ask the questions of, is this something we can do consistent with our legal obligations? But also to ask of themselves, is this something that we should do? But mostly that comes, and there's, a, I think, an inherent responsibility of the policymakers to be asking that question. Mm. John? Well, call me prejudiced, but, but <laughs> my, my, uh, my pick for the first line of defense is the lawyers inside the intelligence community. <clears throat> and as uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa and Michael have said, they have proliferated over the years. I mean, since I... Since I you say uh, that with affection. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, and bemusement. Um, uh, really, that is where, uh, and George and certainly Michael, 
know this. I mean, that is where, inside the agency, that is the first place where the real substance of people, the analysts, the operators, go these days, because they have lawyers literally sitting amongst them in every component of the agency. And, uh, you know, I observed it over the years. I like to think I helped some in that regard over the years. So that, that would, I would say, would be the first line of defense. The second line of defense, and this is a phenomenon that grew out of the Iran-Contra reforms, is a, inspector, a rigorous, tough inspector general system. Inspector generals picked and confirmed, uh, picked by, uh, nominated president, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, we have now in all the in intel agencies, uh, including the uh, DNI, and I will tell you, as a guy who served uh, in the in a CI office inspector general for one year, was sort of a, that, 1984, that was sort of a vacation assignment. Uh, <laughs> in by 8.30, out by 5. I mean, uh, the new, this new, uh, the idea of these inspector generals being truly independent, uh, I think has actually been a boon, a huge boon. Although, you know, those of us who are on the inside will, will, will can tell you from experience, they can be a pain in the butt sometimes when you have to deal with them. But I think they have served a huge purpose. The final thing, uh, and maybe this is probably I should jump this above the others, is the congressional oversight, uh, the House and Senate uh, Intel committees. Um, uh, one of the regrets I have about about the agency post 9-11 and all the controversies over, you know, the interrogation program and the, and the, uh, you know, the uh, black sites. And I, I hold myself part of the, part of, partly responsible for this, is that we didn't tell enough people in the Congress at the time, at that time of great national peril, what we were doing and more importantly, why we felt we had to do it. We kept it to a small group, the so-called Gang of Eight, congressional leadership. Um, the briefings were episodic, off the record, no staff, no transcript. And, uh, you know, I mean, this is a political reality. Three or four years later, after the original briefings about the program, the political tide had turned. And uh, these few members, how do I put this? Uh, not all of them or scrupulously stood up and said that they were aware of the program from the beginning. That was to actually be expected. What we should have done is to tell as many people as possible, certainly the full intel committees, about what we were doing at the time it was being done. It wouldn't have insulated us, but it would have helped. So. That's my lesson. Johnny, is, 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 does, does, does oversight get in the way of the IC doing its job? Well, you know, you know this as well or better than I, Michael. Yeah, oversight can be a huge pain. I mean, you have to, <laughs> they, you know, you have to do briefings. Uh, you spend half your, as you get higher up in the hierarchy, you spend half your time briefing, sometimes members, but frankly, most of the time staff. Uh, when you think you're doing the right thing and the legal standard for reporting to the com intel committees is all uh, significant intel, committee, uh, intel activities, the CIA is, is required to do that. I can't tell you how many times we would dutifully go down to the oversight committee staff and say, well, this is what we're doing now and this is, we think is pretty significant. And they would look at us and say, why are you, why are you telling us this stuff? You know, it's a, so it's a, it's a, it can be hugely frustrating. Uh, and as I say, the second guessing can be, you know, in, 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 uh, in my experience, can be, uh, can be um, very difficult to, because it gets personal. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's, you know, without oversight, especially in Congress, you want to be able to say, yes, we not only followed the law, but look, we're going to put you guys in the boat with us. We're going to tell you what we're doing. Now, if you've got a problem with that, let us know. So 
I just think it's 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 uh, it's it's great for the country, but but for the protection of the intel community, it is uh, indispensable. George, effectiveness. So I agree that there are uh, many many lawyers uh, who I've spent time with uh, <laughs> in the United States government, <laughs> and uh, it's been. A lot of bonding time. <laughs> Director Hayden used to say in speeches that uh, that uh, there are more lawyers in the intelligence community than there are in some intelligence services around the world. Which is true. Which is true. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, there are two broader uh, trends that uh, I think are worth talking about with respect to Congress. Uh, I don't think that we have the congressional oversight piece quite right. <laughs> now, we can attribute that to interesting personalities in Congress or the politics of the day or what have you, but I think there are two broad trends. One sounds a bit silly. One is that um, you know the informal relationships that used to exist, the social relationships that used to exist in Washington don't anymore generally. So the intelligence community's interactions with Congress have become more formal. You march into a hearing room, it's kind of adversarial by definition, and you answer formal questions, et cetera, et cetera. And there used to be a more informal exchange uh, between the executive branch, intelligence community leaders, and Congress, which I think helps. Director Panetta would have coffees on a weekly basis uh, with members of Congress, and I think that helped, um, but it's something to bear in mind. The other trend, I think, is um, a broader trend about our country's politics. It used to be that politics stopped at the water's edge. And now I think that's not the case. And we've seen, regrettably, more of the politicization of intelligence in the Congress, which does not, in my opinion, lead to responsible and informed oversight. Well, to the extent, so I'm, I'm, I'm asking you this question to see if you agree, to the extent that that those trends are happening, it actually makes the oversight in the executive branch of, of the intelligence community even more important to the extent that it's, that it's breaking down to some degree in Congress. Agreed, yeah. agreed, uh, no doubt about it. And there are extensive accountability mechanisms uh, in the executive branch, which you all have uh, referred to. But I think that we need to get back to a time where Congress is a more constructive player uh, in the process. Mark, um, enough, too much, um, not the right kind. What's your sense? I'll give a little insight on, on sort of both sides. I'd also throw in the judiciary as an oversight mechanism. It's one of the areas that those of us in the private sector can use to ensure a degree of oversight at the executive branch, not as much on the legislative branch, a little bit every once in a while. I totally agree with George on the partisanship. I mean, that's been part of the problem, and I'd say it certainly goes back a long way, but I've been in D.C. now for a quarter century. I'd say really like the last 10, 15 years, post 9-11, uh, and we can blame it on redistricting and all sorts of gerrymandering, stuff like that, probably for how it, how it worked, but that's a different subject altogether. But one of the problems from a congressional oversight, as far as when I bring Intel clients up to the oversight committees, one, the HIPC and the SISI, the two intelligence communities, they only have so much staff, for one thing. And the staff are doing a lot of the work than the members. I mean, every once in a while I get to know a member, but I'm usually dealing with staff. And they, as a general rule, and the HIPC functions differently than the SISI in, in the years I've gone to them, just by attitude. It's just a difference between House and Senate. They don't particularly want to hear about individual cases. They want to hear about more of a systemic problem. So I always have to try and say, hey, this client of mine at whatever intel agency is undergoing this issue, and it's not just highlighted to them. They're not just being retaliated because them. There's something bigger for the committee to take a look at. And that's difficult to do very often. Then the other committees, which get lost in the shuffle of any type of intel oversight, is there are a number of committees that, at least by the way they're created, have dual jurisdiction over the intelligence committee, uh, community. The Judiciary Committee, Armed Services, Government Reform, certainly Appropriations, obviously. Now, the Intel Committees obviously have an agreement when they were created in 77, 78 to be the priority, but they're not exclusive. There was a 
fascinating hearing almost two decades ago. The House Government Reform Committee had a hearing about why the CIA refused to cooperate with them. And Jim Woolsey, you probably were there. Yeah. Jim yeah. Woolsey was the <laughs> surrogate witness because uh, the committee was furious that they were not getting any type of uh, cooperation. In fact, the, originally the agency had agreed to show up on some sort of non-controversial issue. And then the CIA, from what it was told to me by someone who was a staffer the other day, talked, out, talked the other agencies out of actually cooperating as, as a group. But part of the problem that also happens, so I'll tell you, I, there's a lot of great oversight in a lot of the agencies and in each of the branches. I think one place where I've been really disappointed, though, is in the inspector generals, particularly in the sense that given the work that I do in representing aggrieved individual employees, whatever it might be, security clearances, uh, let's put aside that they're being investigated by the IG. They, they want to complain about something else within another part of their agency or the IC in general, whether it's a whistleblower or whatever it might be. And, and I got to tell you, other than having personal relationships, which after 25 years, fortunately I will, with folks in different agencies, it's been very hostile from the outside to try and work with the IGs. You would think the ally I would have inside any of the agencies, <laughs> intelligence or otherwise, would be the IG, right? They're supposed to care about whistleblowers. Think about it, how, how it feels on the inside, Mark. I know, <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> but we, we, we don't see it from the outside unless we have a very special personal relationship with someone in the inside that that level of oversight or receptiveness exists, which is a really sad thing. And I, I would love and I continue to try to change it. What do I see as somewhat of a success from an oversight? I think one example I can give uh, would be the ISCAP, Information Security Clearance Appeals Panel, Classification Appeals Panel, sorry, within the National Archives, part of ISU, Information Security Oversight Office. So this is a classification, declassification entity. It's not dealing with whistleblowers and things like that. But from an oversight perspective, why do I say it's a good thing? So this is all executive branch members from a variety of different agencies who, if you make a mandatory declassification request, to an agency to declassify a document, and an agency says no, you can take it to this body, this appeal body of other agencies, including the agency you requested it from, and they will sit in judgment over the decision. And something like the last stats that I saw, 71% of the appeals are successful, meaning that that appeals group overrides the agency that said no, it's classified. So a, a DOD, State Department, NSC person is saying uh, no to an NGA uh, individual who said we can't release this information. That to me is, is fantastic oversight and that's all within the executive branch. What I'd love to see, especially for whistleblowers and clearances quite frankly, is to have another agency within the executive branch oversee a decision process and there's all sorts of debates we can have on it. But when I really see sound, informed, impartial decisions made is if I can get it outside of the agency where they have a personal stake involved, either because of friendships or CYA or embarrassment or whatever it might be. That's when I start to see the difference. Now, that could be Congress. That could be the judiciary. But quite frankly, you found that the it could DNI, be the executive branch. Have you found that the DNI can play that role or not? You so, can be honest here. Yeah. <laughs> You're only on TV. <laughs> totally uh, off the record, Mark. Totally there, the record. there have been times where the DNI has been fantastic in helping out some cases that I had, uh, without a doubt. Uh, I was on a panel with Bob Litt, the former general counsel for the American Bar Association last month, and, and Bob was a great general counsel from the outside when I was dealing with him on issues. I, I will say, and we can have a separate panel on this too, the DNI is still trying to figure out what role it plays within the community and how much oversight and authority it will exert upon the agencies. We are routinely bringing cases to the DNI IG because we're having issues with the CIA IG and, and we're trying to get them to function in the way we think or believe Congress had created it to be sort of this oversight 
body overall. Yeah. But I don't. I, I think they're still haven't reached a level of maturity to play that role. Lisa? Can I just uh, add onto this by saying, I think people are not aware of the level of kind of cross-agency oversight that there is. So for instance, the lawyers who used to work for me in the National Security Division would conduct on-site reviews of what was going on in the National Security Agency, in the FBI, um, for uh, the conduct of national security investigations, and the appropriate use of the FISA authority. So that was kind of cross-agency oversight. Uh, when I was chief of staff to Bob Mueller, I spent, he and I spent many, many, many hours in front of the president's, at the time it was called the president's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, because they were really pushing the transformation uh, of the FBI into a national security focused organization focused on preventing the next attack and the buildup of a more robust intelligence capability. When I was uh, in the White House after the Snowden disclosures, there I said it, um, <laughs> uh, we sought outside expertise on a, uh, and created a commission that you served on uh, where the former acting director of the CIA served hand in glove with a card carrying member of the ACLU, a <laughs> constitutional law professor, Jeff Stone at the University of Chicago, precisely so we could get a variety of perspectives. We had, we had desks that faced each other, so we faced each other every day and we argued and argued and argued and argued. And, and we, it, came, we came to a meeting in the minds. And it made for um, a better product. And it made for a, a set of recommendations, not all of which that we took to the letter, but it forced us internally in the executive branch to really think through. Uh, so those are just three examples of um, executive branch oversight in different flavors that uh, I was a part of that I found to be uh, quite effective. Not perfect, but certainly uh, effective. So, so let me bring together three things here, because you said something that I earlier that I agree with 100%, which is when you have all three branches of government doing oversight, it's, it, it's very effective, right, number one. Um, number two, we talked about Snowden, mm -hmm. right? And number three, we had a discussion about the public. And I'm trying to figure out here how the public fits into this oversight because the Snowden disclosures, um, in particular two of the programs that he disclosed, were two of the programs that had the most oversight in my memory in the history of the intelligence community. Yep. They had executive branch oversight, they had congressional oversight, they had, they had um, judicial oversight, they had oversight by two different White Houses, um, multiple national security teams, multiple, um, multiple HIPSIs, multiple SISIs, um, and multiple FISA decisions, mm -hmm. and yet, the issue exploded because the public reacted in a certain way. Yeah. How, how did you think about that? So I think it, it comes back to this framework that, and you know, it didn't just dawn on me and, and colleagues of mine at, the, at NYU, I should give a shout out to who've written on this, uh, Zach Goldman and Sam Raskoff, about this notion of um, compliance and governance. Because so I think what happened, what the Snowden uh, disclosures revealed was take, for instance, the 215 program. This is the collection of uh, telephone metadata subject to um, robust oversight in the executive branch, FISA court uh, oversight, multiple different judges approving of this, lots of um, um, uh, oversight by the Congress, uh, and inspector general oversight, I should, I should note. Um, but when it became public, uh, all of that uh, the, the way our constitutional structure was set up to have all of those branches um, engaged and overseeing to lend that, uh, over, that activity legitimacy, it was not seen that way by the public. I mean, it, that's an overgeneralization, but uh, so much so that it, it, the, uh, a different law was passed um, to put it under different authorities. So, uh, so in, a, in essence, I think what, what the Snowden disclosures revealed was that this, um, this activity was lawful. Uh, now there was a, a court in the district court that, that had a different view, but uh, multiple courts um, and all the oversight that I indicated, and it was done pursuant to a statute in Congress, I think you could say it was lawful but deemed illegitimate in the eyes of many in the public. So what do you do? And what does the intelligence community do uh, in that instance? And I think what the answer is is 
a public debate, which is what we which is what we ended up having, and ultimately a retention of the authority in the executive branch, but changing it to house that information uh, in the in the phone companies instead of at the National Security Agency. But that was done pursuant to a congressional statute. And George, I'm wondering from where you sat as you looked at the Snowden disclosure, to what extent you thought that the public reaction um, was because we didn't handle the issue from a public relations perspective as well as we could have. Yeah, and I don't mean to sound uh, critical here of, any, of anybody, because I certainly didn't bet a 1,000 uh, when I was in government. But I remember going back to 2007 when I first uh, became a spokesman at the agency, and I was talking to one of my NSA public affairs colleagues, and I said, you guys better start talking more and developing more relationships, getting your message out to the public, sharing your mission, because your day is going to come. Now, I didn't think that day would ever come uh, with Snowden and so forth, but we were having some tough times at the agency. Uh, we were getting some really bad coverage, and uh, despite all my efforts to tell people that we were operating within the confines of American law and policy, uh, it was a tough sell. And I didn't really see that pivot on the part of NSA. And they have maintained, with some exception, and I will give credit to Director Hayden, who was much more open as an NSA director than, than some others uh, during his time there. But they never really developed that. It's been a, a bit of a no comment environment at NSA for a very long time. Now that goes back to the culture of this incredible agency with incredible people in it. Of course, until 1996, it was no such agency, right? Didn't actually even acknowledge its own existence. I might be getting the date wrong, but it's close. And so when the Snowden disclosures hit in 2013, and I was at the Pentagon at the time, watching this unfold on a Sunday afternoon, I immediately thought to myself, NSA has no reputational capital in the bank. And this is going to be a very bad, I mean, it's bad, period. Uh, it's a crisis. <laughs> and a crisis is when they're coming through the windows, and they were coming through the windows. But they had no ability to effectively tell their story. And they had missed several opportunities, in my humble opinion, to defend broadly, without going into classified detail publicly, to defend their work, the men and women of the NSA, and its uh, vitally important programs. So, so what's more important at the end of the day, the mechanisms of oversight or the people, the integrity of the people who are operating inside of those mechanisms? Mm -hmm. In other words, could, could, could another Iran-Contra affair happen today, even with all this oversight? John? John, John what do you think? <laughs> Here I go again, the uh, geriatric in the group. <laughs> yeah, I was the... Uh, <clears throat> I was the, I had the swell job of being the congr uh, liaison between CIA and the Iran Contra committees. <clears throat> Short answer, Michael, is there were a lot of unique personalities uh, in the executive branch at that time, both at the agency, at the NSC, uh, and in Congress. I think I was like not even born. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Where For the I? record, Lisa was not involved <laughs> in her own Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah. I was born, but she was not involved. So about the Spanish-American war job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bay of Pigs. You want to hear about the Bay of Pigs? Um, right, I've lost control here. <laughs> no, I, I would just say, Michael, I don't... The Iran Contra affair was sui generis. Uh, since then... Uh, the oversight mechanisms have been built up. Since that time, the Inspector General has become a presidential Senate confirmed position, as is the CIA General Counsel. Um, I don't think it can happen. Uh, it could happen again. I think the I think the country learned lessons and Congress learned lessons. One last thing about the Iran Contra scandal I've talked about publicly before. It, it's hard to say I'm nostalgic about it, but one thing about the Iran-Contra <laughs> Committee was it was this you know, joint committee. You, you remember that, Michael? You, mm -hmm. you were? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 26 members. I was not involved either. <laughs> <laughs> 26 members. You know, Republicans, Democrats, House and Senate. There was a unanimity, a consensus. You know, it's, one, the CIA had screwed up. 
but two that that you know don't you know try to keep in perspective the you know the misguided but well-intentioned policy role here uh, underlying all of it. The, in other words, in those days when Congress got mad at us, it was on a bipartisan basis. <laughs> now, you know, everyone just retreats to their corner, depending on who's sitting in the White House. I mean, you know, you've had that experience. So, Mark, do you agree that, that something significant can't happen again? I think something significant can happen again. I don't know if it could happen at the, the grander scale of Iran-Contra. I mean, I, I absolutely have seen many Iran-Contras happen where usually my clients suspected of doing something they shouldn't be doing as a case officer, wherever it might be. And so it, it does, but again, then those were caught by the agencies, uh, whether they were right or wrong as to whether my client was engaged in something. Uh, there was, I was involved with the able danger issues back already, what, a dozen, 15 years ago, which was not a major controversy in that type of situation. But when it became known and able danger was this data mining operation that DOD and some of the intel agencies were doing and gets controversial depending on how you, what view you have of it. But there, there were aspects where when we had congressional hearings on it that uh, agencies weren't sure of how they were reacting to one another and there started to be allegations that in, uh, individual intelligence officers were off on their own doing certain operations that they weren't. And then they would, of course, say, well, they had been authorized by so-and-so, but whether it was put down in writing or not. And, and it was one of these things where now we look back, you know, a dozen years later, and we talked to some of the people who were the superiors we said had authorized it and who had denied it then, but now they're out of government service and, you know, they'll have a beer with us and say, yeah, yeah, I actually, I remember telling you it was okay to do. So that's obviously a degree of, of frustration, uh, to say the least. Um, but, you know, it, it, it can happen without a doubt. And, and I, you know, going back to a little bit on the Snowden, I, I really do think the, the Snowden situation, the public reaction was a, a PR failure by the government. Again, not in anticipating what could likely happen and then how to react to it. You know, it's, now it's the fifth anniversary in past June, and there are very little, very few articles. Go look, go Google what was in the last few months. Very few articles talking about Snowden in the last five years and what the impact has been since. And I would dare say, and those in the government will know better than I, that the programs are probably stronger and more active now, legally, completely legal, because as like Lisa said, complete oversight and a new statute. Now Congress can't complain that they didn't know about it as they did in some of the litigation that came out of Snowden's disclosures. But the key thing from the PR standpoint, if we only look at the domestic surveillance program, we now get uh, Fisk, FISA court decisions declassified. Sure, they have some redactions, but we can see what the analysis is and the program still goes strong. We can have congressional hearings on it and information's released, and the program's still going strong. If that, that could easily have happened beforehand. I mean, we were talking about the program on television in 2000, I remember going on MSNBC in 2007, talking about aspects as it had started to leak out. And instead of embracing it and saying, well, let's reveal some information, the agencies decided, no, we're not gonna do anything, and that frankly contributed to Snowden, right or wrong, quite frankly wrong, as far as I'm concerned, uh, to doing what he did for ideological purposes. Did you want to add a point? Yeah, so I, I would just add a point on, um, first I had complete um, sympathy for uh, George Little and his colleagues and, and having to deal, mm -hmm. I mean George didn't have to deal with Snowden, but his, his press uh, colleagues in the agencies in not being armed, not being able, uh, really had their hands tied because of the the appropriate classification at the time of a lot of these uh, programs. So uh, it is true that the, that the government was not able to kind of turn on a dime to explain these things, but it did uh, force a lot, uh, a lot more uh, declassification. Um, yeah. Okay, let's open it up to questions. Um, I can't see very well because of the lights, so please, right here. Yep, 
Mike's coming. I think. <laughs> Here it comes. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you to the panel for being here tonight because this is crucial to how we talk about democracy and, tr and secrecy and finding that balance for Intel oversight. Um, so my name is Jennifer Smith Hayes. I'm a PhD in public policy and my focus is on intelligence oversight. So thank you for being here. Okay. Um, <laughs> so my research question looks at um, what the mechanisms are that Congress, the executive branch and agencies choose to employ for different problem sets. And specifically, I look at what commissions, why we choose commissions, and why Congress, agencies, and the executive branch chooses commissions over the executive branch using the PIAB and PCLOB, agencies using OGC, IG, or um, the um, ombudsman, which we did not talk about tonight, as well as Congress committee hearings or with staff studies. So things I've looked at are expertise, accountability for intelligence scandal and failures, and agenda setting. That's crucial. So kind of looking at that, what are your perspectives on your time in government? Because it's changed over time about why these different political principles choose to use commissions as independent outside lookers to hold government accountable. Just kind of interested in your perspective. Why did President Obama choose to do a commission? Because um, in the wake of the um, Snowden disclosures, they, we fired up all of the mechanisms we've talked about in terms of getting insight from the President's Intelligence Advisory Board, from the um, PCLOB, from the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, et cetera. But we needed to have some outside perspective, right? And from um, a different uh, group of disciplines necessarily than were um, uh, represented on, uh, on those bodies. And so we specifically decided to get to put together this panel um, with folks who had served in the government, those who had never served in the government, those who came from, uh, a, um, from different perspectives, who had different bases of expertise to really give us uh, a wide range of views. Was there, was there a, I don't want to say this the right way, was there a political aspect, was, a, was, was there a public relations aspect to it as well? Oh, oh certainly. I mean, I think the, the notion that, I mean, there was a reason why we thought we needed uh, to get a broader set of views. Um, also, because I think you know, President Obama tended to take the long view on issues. He saw a lot of what was emerging in the Snowden disclosures, aside from the individual programs, but and it reflected the public response. So, kind of stepping back, a number of us inside government in the in the wake of the Snowden disclosures talked about how had this been public um, at the time some of these programs were being adopted in the wake of 9/11, for instance. Might the public have um, digested them differently? But in a world where we were you know, 10, 12 years hence, and technology taking on different roles uh, in our lives, um, you know, th it, was a, it was being disclosed in a different environment. And we needed uh, to grapple with that in a broader context. And I would just add, in the terms of the National Defense Strategy Commission that I was just on, you know, that's a once every four years Congress wanting an independent view, right? Wanting a different view um, about the country's defense needs than it gets from um, the administration itself. So it's just an independent view. Over here. Why don't you sir first and then we'll go down to the, the far end. Thank you, my name is Steve Hirsch, I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, my question is to Mr. Rizzo, uh, uh, when, when you talk about the roots of oversight, uh, going back to the church committee, which uh, excellent, although I just add that may also go back to uh, Sam Irvin's constitutional rights subcommittee oversight hearings on um, intelligence committee, on intelligence community surveillance of civilians that led to Watergate, but it was all of a piece. The, the intelligence oversight mechanism that evolved from that controversy up to and including the church committee hearings. Do you feel that uh, it has, the structure has weathered itself well, well over the time since then? Because that was, that was set up at a different time and it was set up in response to a different set of problems uh, than we face now. Yeah, I mean, the short answer, yes. I mean, as, as, as you recall, the church committee was a 
special committee set up. There was no intelligence committees <clears throat> at that point. And, uh, you know, it was, in, in many ways it was, it was uh, kind of a sensational law of posturing from uh, both sides of the uh, witness table on the dais. But the, inst but the creation of the intelligence committees, I mean, I think we've actually been fortunate with some exceptions over the last, what, 40 years, the heads of the two intelligence committees, uh, regardless of party, regardless of whether House or Senate, they've been good. They've been responsible. They've been uh, conscientious. There have been, as I say, a few notable exceptions to that rule. But no, I think, as I said earlier, I think the intelligence committee structure is uh, not only not only uh, part of our democracy. Uh, I think it's you know I think it's a, a huge uh, uh, insurance policy for the intelligence agencies. Um, so yeah, I would say I would say it's uh, it's a, it's a evolved uh, very effectively. And the executive branch mechanism that's set up in response to that has that weathered the years well or. Well, I you know I will defer to Lisa and Michael, but I you know I I, uh, I left the government in two thousand nine. Honestly, in my in my time, I mentioned the uh, intelligence oversight board and the uh, PIFI app. Honestly, I didn't view them at the time as terribly rigorous. I, you know, they were appointed by the president, had a lot of distinguished people on them, but it just they weren't. I mean, I just have to tell you, from being inside at that point, that was not, I never viewed them as terribly um, rigorous, so. Down at the end, ma'am? Yes, my question, I'm Courtney Fleming. I've worked as a contractor supporting CIA, DNI, various intelligence communities, private, and then um, I did public service. So my question really is about the mechanism of the IG's office and how they can truly be effective when they report to the head of the CIA um, themselves. They're not really independent at all, in my opinion. Um, they're not statutorily independent. I know, Mr. Rizzo, you mentioned at the CIA, you know, they, they do have to go through an appointment, but they still report to the head of CIA. They don't report to an outside organization. Um, I know at NGA, they report to, at one point, they're reporting to the head of NGA, and I think that's the case at the, all the other intelligence organizations. Um, can you speak to that? Michael, you wanna? So I can. Um, so every IG that I um, <laughs> worked closely with um, during my seven years on the CIA seventh floor, um, I certainly felt that they felt they were independent. Um, I certainly felt that they felt that they could report to the director um, and to the deputy director and to me when I was the number when I was my cadence number three, um, what they were thinking. Um, they were they were statutory in the sense that they could go directly to the hill. They did not need our permission to go to the hill, and they and they fre and they frequently did. Um, so, so I think they had the independence they needed. My issue with the IG has always been effectiveness. I mean, I, th I always thought that the audit piece of the IG did, an, did a magnificent job in, 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 in auditing the various activities of the agency and pointing out where there were problems. I think the inspection part of the IG didn't really ever tell me anything I didn't already know. Um, there was no, there, these were people who were on, on rotation for short periods of time. Um, you were probably in the inspection staff? I was, yes. Um, these were people <laughs> who were on short rotations from other parts of the agency for a short period of time. They didn't bring any expertise. They didn't give me a lot of insight into a particular unit that they were inspecting. And the investigative side of the IG, I felt that they didn't have the investigative resources that they really needed to dig into an issue. Um, and get all the facts in one place so you can make a decision. So my issue with the IG was its effectiveness, not its independence. And this goes a little bit what I was talking about before. If, if I bring, yeah, the audits, 
it was easy. They checked the badge reading machines and was the person there at work or not at work, which was complicated when you represented case officers who wouldn't show up at headquarters and proving that they were actually working, but that's another story. <laughs> but from the inspection standpoint, if I wanted to bring a whistleblower to an IG, I mean, look, the, your agencies are very small. I mean, we live in a small town, DC, coming from New York. This is a town as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> And, and the agencies are pretty small, especially on the operational side. So when you have folks who are going on rotation for X period of years, everybody knows one another or is connected to one another. So if you try and bring a whistleblower over to inside the agency, even though a lot of times the IG, in my experience, sometimes didn't get along with the director. I remember a few cases I had where they were totally at loggerheads, which sometimes was good or bad for my clients. But you know, to bring someone where the individuals doing the investigating have a relationship with the people we're reporting on, or they may go back to that directorate or office, was problematic, which is why I love to see some sort of external oversight for at least for whistleblowers, so that you can bring someone to get a completely unbiased, independent view of a particular agency. There's going to be pushback, obviously, uh, because of equities, but the thing about whistleblowers that I've, that's always bothered me, if, if you look at it on paper, the work that I do, I have a nonprofit called Whistleblower Aid that represents whistleblowers for free, especially in the community. We're all on the same page, right? All the laws are in favor of whistleblowers. All the presidential proclamations are in favor of whistleblowers. You encourage whistleblowers until one actually blows the whistle internally, <laughs> <laughs> and then they don't feel like they're really being looked at in a friendly way. So it, it's frustrating when we're trying to bring people who, who do want to do it the right way, and there are people who want to do it the right way, and there are people who don't do it at all because they're concerned if they do it the right way, they'll be penalized, but they're not received well enough. That's where the oversight dimension falls short as far as I'm concerned, and it's sad because it's, the mechanism on paper is there. That's where the people come in. That's where the relationships come in. And the danger is if you don't feel like you're being taken seriously within the mechanisms that have been created, you go outside the mechanisms. It, yeah, look. And that's damaging know, to, to everybody at the end of the day. Snowden said, I don't agree with it, but Snowden said he went outside the system because he saw how others were treated. Now, I could debate whether that was legitimate as to how he saw it, but it doesn't matter because that's what he thought, and that's why he did what he did. Back here. It's coming. <laughs> I'm Colin AJ. I work for the United States Army, which parenthetically just beat Navy again on Saturday. <laughs> um, Congratulations. So, so my question is a follow-up to Mr. Rizzo's comment that you wish you had uh, been more forthcoming on the Hill and garnered more support. So, so, so let me play devil's advocate. If you had done that, what do you think the odds are that somebody who disagreed with you, I mean, we are at the press club, would have leaked it and it would have been adjudicated not through legitimate oversight, uh, but through the media. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of hearing that you think more things need to be uh, weighed by the public. So, so maybe that is the way we should go. Yeah, I think if we had been, if, if from the beginning of the interrogation program, the secret prison system, <clears throat> early 2002, the political climate in the country and this is Congress, this is the media, this is the American people, was, would have been supportive. And in fact, at the time we briefed the eight congressional leaders, at that point, uh, they were all tremendously supportive. For instance, on the interrogation techniques, as we walked through them with all their excruciating detail, the reaction we would get from both Republicans and Democrats, okay, is this enough? Is this, do you need to do anything more? Now, I don't know whether they would have leaked it then. I can tell you I didn't discern any opposition or revulsion. Now, four years later, of course, you know, we're further away from 9-11, the political winds changed. I just think if we had just gone down there and put it on the record with transcripts and say, okay, this is what waterboarding is, it would be, it would be like the the so-called torture opinion, because I, I would have read it verbatim. At least 
they couldn't have said years later, the ones, you know, 98% of congressmen didn't know, they could accurately say, I had never knew this was going on and I am repulsed. But for those eight, at least they couldn't have said like they did, oh, wait, I didn't, maybe I got brief, but they didn't tell me enough or, or I didn't, I always opposed it, you know, because we had no record. That's what I was talking about. And well, in so fact, the program started to get leaked. Uh, well, let's also be clear, though, too, and that is that the White House, John, has a lot of say in what you brief to Congress. Oh, yeah. That was, yeah. I mean, I said I took a, a role in this, but, but the decision came out of the, uh, actually, the vice president's office at the time to limit the briefings and limited them for four years until General Hayden arrived. And he went back and said, we can't sustain this. So. It's one of the many great acts of uh, service the general did for, for uh, our agency. So I would add this. Um, I've, I've, I briefed Congress on uh, many, many times on extraordinarily sensitive issues um, with both member and staff in the room. Um, and nothing that I briefed to Congress ever leaked. Um, it, 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 it's um, not, not well known, but uh, most of the leaks of classified information do not come out of Congress. They come out of the executive branch for all sorts of reasons. Um, I never had anything leaked that I told to Congress. I agree with that. Question. Over here. Hi there. Um, I guess I'll throw this question up to the panel. Um, I found it very interesting that you mentioned about the review process for appeals for revealing whether we should um, declassify or classify information. Um, what struck me immensely was the idea that the other agencies would strike down a decision, or uh, the representatives thereof. And I guess I just wanted to delve a little bit further. How would you all explain that? To me, I would think there would be a little bit more empathy there. Oh, I wouldn't want to overturn a fellow agency's decision. Additionally, if we're talking about oversight, if this model is effective, could we apply it to other parts of the intelligence community that could use more oversight? Oh, throw it up to you guys. Mark, I think you were talking about the... the I, I did, but I don't have any inside knowledge of how it works within yeah. the agencies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From an attitude standpoint, I. I I mean, I, look, I, I've actually, I've represented some of the folks who have been on the, that panel over the years, and I worked with ISU directors for many years. We lost Steve Garfinkel recently, unfortunately, who I'm sure many of you knew, and he was there for a long, long period of time. And I mean, Bill Leonard, who I, I've represented in some FOIA matters and some of the Espionage Act cases where he's been the expert witness, like in the APAC case, and, you know, I always saw that they took their job seriously and applied what rules, what the declassification guides stated. And frankly, they weren't, to me, what was made the difference, and, and hopefully maybe someone else can say from the inside, the difference was they didn't have any equities in it that didn't feel personal to them. I mean, that's usually what I saw made the difference. There was something about whatever the issue was that that agency that was classifying it didn't want that information out or thought that Pandora's box would open. And the other members of the community who would oversee it would be like, no, what, what are you talking about? We don't think anything bad is going to happen. I mean, that's how all the PDBs started coming right. out was actually through this process. I was going to, in fact, I was going to add that in my experience, it's, it's arbitrary rules that get debated. No PDBs. Right. For the longest time, it was no PDBs get declassified um, because it impinges on the president's decision making. Um, it's, gonna, it's going to discourage analysts from calling it like they see it. Um, and so you know, that, that's a position the CIA took for years until President Bush decided to, to declassify a PDB, and then that fell apart. Right? So, so in my experience, people debate these, these rules, which tend to be arbitrary. Um, they, don't, they don't debate individual declassification decisions very often. There's, most, there, there's agreement about most of those. Although, I mean, I can say, and you were part of some of these discussions too, um, I was not 
ever part of the uh, process that Mark described, but I was part of uh, a number of uh, discussions around the Situation Room table about um, whether or not to declassify certain things. Um, and uh, folks brought their equities to the table. In other words, you know, if, if this were to be de declassified, what would the impact be? Uh, and we would hear uh, from the CIA, we would hear from the NSA, we would hear from uh, the foreign policy, from the diplomatic corps about what the impacts would be and uh, discuss them and, and ultimately either made decisions or, or teed those up to the president. And so I think, frankly, um, some, of the, some of those processes should be uh, at that level and have those equities debated. Yeah, that's what happened with the uh, so-called torture memos in, in early, early 2009. Right. Decision to declassify them. Yeah. If, if, if there were less classification, frankly, you know, we've overclassified. You know, this is not, I'm not the first person to say that, but we've overclassified a lot. And if we understood and agreed to what information was actually secret, then we can have more informed debate over what we should release and what we shouldn't. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Larry. All right, everybody, uh, a, a sign of a good panel is leaving everybody wanting more, and there's plenty <laughs> of questions uh, that need to still be asked. So we'd love for you to do that uh, at the reception. Uh, when it comes time, uh, when we conclude here, I would ask you to exit through the rear doors, give our panel members an opportunity to head out through the side door here and actually maybe get a drink in their hand before you ambush <laughs> them. Um, I'd like to just give a head nod to uh, the folks of the uh, Hayden Center and the Shar School. Anything that went well tonight is to their credit. Anything that went wrong tonight is my oversight. Uh, so please, a quick round of applause for our staff. Uh, we, we, we also have uh, some blank note cards available as you exit the rear of the auditorium, and we have some pens available. If you feel inclined to write a note of encouragement for General Hayden, we'd love for you to take time to do that, and we'll make sure that uh, he and his family get them as soon as possible. Uh, last but not least, I just want to thank this wonderful panel, Michael Morell, Lisa Monaco, John Rizzo, George Little, Mark Zaid, for, uh, I think, offering you a lot of great food for thought about the great mechanisms we have in place to try to ensure that we're doing the right thing uh, for the American people. So a quick final round of applause, and let's go have a drink.